So one thing that's really important to understand about the domain is understanding restrictions. See, when we have an equation like this, f of x is equal to a 2x squared minus 3, there's no restrictions on the domain. And what I mean by that is no matter what number you plug in for x, you're always going to be able to square it, multiply by 2, and then subtract by 3. That's why the domain here is going to be all real numbers, right? Any number all the way to negative infinity, all the way up to positive infinity, you can plug into this function and you are going to get a output value. However, not all functions are the same. Some functions have restrictions on their domain. What I mean by that is let's go and take a look at this function. g of x equals a square root of x minus 5. Now in this case, if I want to find a g of 4, look what happens when I plug in 4 as my input value. Now what I have is a 4 minus 5 all under a square root. And hopefully you remember square root is any number multiplied by itself. So in this case, what we get is a 4 minus 5 is going to be a negative number. Well, we cannot take the square root of negative 1 because there's no number in our real number system, which is going to be exactly the same that multiplies to give us a negative 1. That's why in the imaginary number system, we use i, but that's not what we're talking about here. I want you to understand that this function is not defined for 4. But guess what? There's more numbers that this function is not defined for. Really, any number that's going to be smaller than 5 is not going to work here, right? 3 won't work. 2 won't work. 0 won't work. Negative 5 won't work. Any number smaller than 5 is not going to be in this domain. But it doesn't stop right there. Another restriction I want to look at is in this function. So if I had a h of x is equal to a 1 over a x minus 4. Here, when we plug in a 4, so if I say to h of 4, we're going to get a 1 over a 4 minus 4. Well, 4 minus 4 is going to be 0, so you say, okay. And then, uh-oh, we cannot divide by 0. So 4 in this function for h of x is not defined for 0. That means 4 is not in the domain. But when I think about any other number, it doesn't really matter if I do a negative 3. It doesn't really matter if I do f5. All other numbers, I seem like I can plug into this function, I'm going to get a value. The only number that I cannot plug into is 4 because that is what makes my denominator equal to 0. So for these two restrictions, we can actually summarize this. We can only take the square root of positive numbers and we cannot divide by 0. Now, algebraically, how we can write that out is we can basically say whatever is under my radical, x minus 5, has to be greater than or equal to 0, right? That's the same thing as saying whatever's under my radical has to be positive. We can just say it has to be greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, I could add a 5 to both sides and I could say x has to be greater than or equal to 5, right? Now, another way that we can actually express this would actually be using a graph, right? So this is what represents all the numbers that are in the domain, right? All the numbers that you can take the square root of because it makes the radicand positive. If I was just going to go ahead and graph a nice little number line to represent this inequality, I'll go ahead and start at 5 because it's kind of easy. It's greater than or equal to. Remember, that's going to be an open circle that's going to be filled in, right? Because 5 is included. Because if you do 5 minus 5, that's 0. Square root of 0 is just going to be 0. So 5 does work, but it's going to be all numbers that are greater than 5. So that is how we can represent it graphically. And then one last way we can represent this domain is using interval notation. I can take the inequality, I can write it as a graph, and then I can say, well, what about intervals? What is the farthest left interval that this domain is defined for. And this example is going to be 5, but 5 is included. Therefore, I'm going to use a bracket. It looks like the domain is going to continue infinitely to the right. So therefore, I'm going to say all the way to infinity. And since infinity is not defined, I'm going to use a parenthesis. Now, looking back at this previous function, the way that we can summarize this function is you cannot divide by 0. Dividing by 0 is not going to be defined. So in this example, what I simply want to do is just say, well, anything that makes my denominator equal to 0 is not going to be in my domain. So what I'm going to do is just take my denominator and set it equal to 0. Those are going to be the values that are not in the domain. So again, it's a little bit different than what we did over here, but it's kind of like the same idea. We're just looking for values that are not in the domain rather than all the values that are in the domain. So again, sometimes I used to like sometimes say like it can not equal zero, right? In this case, as long as you understand these are values that are not in the domain because these are the values that make your denominator equal to zero. So in this one is pretty easy to solve. So I get x is equal to a four. x equals four is what makes the denominator zero. So therefore, this is not in the domain. So again, another way you could say is like x cannot equal four, right? For as far as domain notation. But let's just go and look at this at a graphical approach. As long as you understand that x equals four is not in the domain. So let's go to number line. Now, if it's not in the domain, that means it's not defined. I'm going to use an open circle. There's no other number that I found that I cannot plug in for x. So therefore, my function is only undefined at 4, but then everything else from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. Now, when we want to go and look at this as far as our interval notation, what I want you to see is I just kind of treat these as like two different intervals. We have an interval to the left of my undefined value, 
and I have an interval to the right of my undefined value. Four is undefined, so therefore I'm gonna be using parentheses. Negative infinity is undefined, so I'm gonna use parentheses. So the way this is gonna look here is I can say it, the farthest left this domain is gonna go is negative infinity. The farthest right it's gonna go before there's an undefined value is going to be at four. I can go and look over here. The farthest left this interval goes is at four, and the farthest right it goes is going to be positive infinity. And again, remember, none of these values are actually defined at their value like five. And then if you wanna connect them, you can go ahead and use the union symbol to connect the two. These are just two restrictions uh, for functions that we're going to focus on in this video. There's many other functions we could deal with finding the domain as well as different restrictions. But I want to keep things simple here. And I want you just to focus on the two things that I think is the easiest for students to start out remembering. You cannot divide by a negative number and you cannot divide by zero. So let's go and take a look at four different examples and just kind of practice being able to identify our domain without knowing what the graph looks like. If you do know what the graph looks like, you could always graph it and then like identify how far left, how far right the graph goes for the domain and how low or how high the graph goes for the range. But for simple equations, that can work. But when you get into more difficult problems, that's not always going to be the best solution. So let's go and take a look at using these restrictions to find the domain. I love looking at a problem like this, especially once we just dealt with the restrictions, because it still kind of gets a little confusing for students. If I say, what's the domain of this function? Now you might know what this graph looks like. You might not know what this graph looks like. But again, I want you to understand what we just talked about. We just talked about restrictions on the domain. You can't take the square root of a negative number. You can't divide by zero. In this rule, in this function, is there any way we're going to be dividing by zero? No. So in this case, you can say, yeah, guys, the domain here is going to be all real numbers. It's going to be from negative infinity to infinity. I just want to verify this or just show you what this graph would look like graphically, just in case you were wondering. So we have a negative three, and then we're going to go up to one, two, three. So that graph is going to look something like this. And you can see that the graph is, yeah, it's going to be defined for all X values infinitely going to the left, as well as going to the right. Now, in this next example, you can definitely see we have a square root, right? It might not be as easy for us to understand what the graph is, depending on your experience with graphing square roots. However, the one thing I want you to take away from this video is you cannot take the square root of a negative number. So therefore, when you're trying to find the domain, just set the radicand, what is under the radical, greater than or equal to zero. So I have a negative 2t plus 7 is greater than or equal to zero. All right, now let's just go ahead and use our inverse operations to go ahead and solve. So I subtract a 7 on both sides, negative 2t is going to be greater than or equal to a negative 7. Now remember, here, whenever you divide by a negative number, right, what do you do? You flip the sign, right? And again, you can just flip them back over to the other way to make it positive if you wanted to. You know, just remember to flip those signs because now what I have here is I have a t is going to be less than or equal to a 7 halves. So that's very, very important for us to understand. What's going on here is there's actually a reflection about this graph. The values of my function that make this equation true are going to be values that are less than a 7 halves. If you're kind of confused on that, let's just go and pick a number. Like, what's the easy easiest number that's less than seven halves. Well, what about zero, right? If you plug zero in for T, zero times negative two is going to be zero. Zero plus seven, square root of seven is 2.6457513, right? Now, how would you write this on interval notation? Well, again, you can just go and take a look at a number line. You know, here's seven halves, right? Here'd be like zero. Now, this is going to be greater than like, what, three? So, you know, we can maybe say like, here's four, right? But it's all values that are less than seven halves. So that's going to be going to the left. Now it's less than or equal to. So therefore I'm going to fill that in and then I'm going to go all the way over here. So therefore when I want to write this domain in interval notation, I'm going to say, well, this is actually going all the way to the left, negative infinity, all the way to seven halves. But again, since that's included, I'm going to be using my bracket. If you want to know what this graph kind of looks like, it's basically going to be the square root function, but it's going to be reflected about the y axis. So here is going to be my seven halves. And then the graph is actually going to look something like that. Okay, so therefore you can see, oh yeah, the domain is all negative values, but there's nothing greater than seven halves, right? Again, like that makes sense. If you plugged in four, right? Four is greater than that. Four times negative two is negative eight. Negative eight plus seven is gonna be a negative one. That's not gonna work. Okay, so if we look at this example, you can see that now we have an A as our input value. But again, we see that our A is in the denominator. And the second thing that I need you to remember is you cannot divide by zero. Well, what values makes your denominator equal to zero? It's not as easy as the last example we looked at, right? The last example, it's like, oh, four, four minus four equals zero. But what is this example? What is this number going to be? So again, like sometimes you might be able to do it in your head, but if you can't, just set the denominator equal to zero and solve. That value is gonna be what makes the denominator equal to zero. That value is not gonna be in the domain, right? It's not defined. One minus a two a equal to zero, and I'm gonna go ahead and solve. Now you can just use your inverse operations, depending on how good you are at math or your inverse operations, you can just take this as slow as you want to. So a is equal to one half. One half is not in the domain. I can go ahead and write this on a number line, 
right? Doesn't matter how nice your number line is, but at one half, it's going to be an open circle. There's no other variables anywhere else. The only value that I understand, the only restriction that I see here is when my denominator is equal to zero. So therefore, everything else is going to be defined to the left as well as to the right. So therefore now, again, I can write this as a negative infinity to a positive one half union a one half to a positive infinity. Okay, in the last example here, we have the cube root. Now we haven't talked about the cube root and a lot of times the cube root will sometimes throw students for, you know, a kind of loop like, oh, well, is it the same restriction as the square root? Like, I don't even know what that graph looks like. And that's good. That's why I wanted to explore the cube root in part of this explanation. When I have the square root of four, that could be a two times two, or that could be a negative two times a negative two. I cannot take the square root of a negative four, right? That's not going to work. The numbers have to be exactly the same. This is not going to be able to work in our real number system. What if I had the cube root of eight? right? So the cube root of eight is going to be a repeated multiplication three times. So that's going to be a two times a two times a two, right? They have to be exactly the same. And guess what? What about if I take the cube root of a negative eight? Well, that is going to be a negative two times a negative two times a negative two. Because again, negative two times negative two is positive four. Positive four times negative two is going to be a negative eight. So it works. That means you can take the cube root of a positive as well as a negative number. So what I want you to understand here is when you have this cube root, there's no restriction on my x. I can plug in any real number in for x and I'm going to be able to get a value. And I can further validate this by just showing you what the graph looks like of a function with no transformations for the cube root. If I had the g of x equals cube root of x here, that graph looks something like this. You can see my x is going to be defined for all x values. So it doesn't matter if I shift the graph to the right or anything else, this domain is going to be all real numbers. Okay, so now that you have a little bit of a handle on restrictions and identifying the domain with different functions, now what I want to do is look closely in how do we find the range. So if you're ready to be able to use this understanding of restrictions to find the range, go ahead in the next video I have for you here. Or if you just want more examples of finding the implied domain, check out the examples I have for you down below. Cheers.